Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Welcome to your day off. My name is Corey. And actually, today's a little bit of an interesting day because I have a, I have a new friend named Christine Sherwood. Christine is the uh, host of the Beauty Pro podcast. Um, we decided to do a collaboration today because uh, we are, well, we're excited to talk to our guests today. But uh, but before we get into that, Christine, man, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I am the host of the Beauty Pro podcast, and I am also an internationally certified life and business coach. I go by the beauty pro coach. Very simple. Likes to keep it happy. And I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Well, this I is hope your certifications first... is enough for me too, because I'm not certified to do shit. So Oh, yeah. stop it. You're fabulous. <laughs> gotta cover that. You're licensed in fabulosity. There you go. Oh, I like that. Is that official? Yes, I'm right now. That. That, Just now. That, that's awesome. So uh today today's exciting. So um, you know, you and I chatted about uh actually we did, I think it was during threads. Like, does anyone talk about threads out loud or is it just people that are on threads? But we had a conversation on threads and um uh about about bringing on our guest today. And uh mm -hmm. I thought it would be a super interesting conversation. And then so I reached out to uh to to uh to Mary Chromines and Mary was able to uh, to arrange our conversation today with with Mr. Robert Chromines. Um and if you haven't heard um, Robert had just announced just a couple of weeks ago that, that he's retiring from the industry and like, what, a what a huge void that is, you know, not just for Paul Mitchell, but, but, but for the industry. I mean, you know, uh, Robert, Robert held the stage for so many, so, so, so many years, um, and, you know, uh, own that stage, his own stage in there. So, you know, what, what do you, what do you, what are you interested about chatting with today? Christine. Who are you talking to? Me? Christine. Christine. Me we'll or Robert? In a sec. It's not about him yet. We'll get to him. Oh, okay. I'm like ready to go. Yeah, I am very excited. I have some questions that from the first time, no, let's rewind. The first, when I was like seven and my mom is playing Robert Cromian's business CDs, yeah. I was like, who's this? What is this voice as a little girl? And then meeting Robert at Premiere. Um, I grabbed him and I said, Hey, I know you, can you take a picture? And you go, calm down. Yes. Okay. Let's go. I was like, okay, thanks. And I like ran away. Like, anyway, so I'm very excited. I have some questions. You're fangirling a little bit. W w yeah. I'm fangirling. I'm not going to deny it. This is awesome. Like yeah. this is my birthday month and I'm celebrating all month. So Robert, thank you for being a part of my birthday month. Happy birthday to you. It's my wife's well, birthday this month. Oh, uh, that, I'm birthday, the 20th. Robert? She's the 30th. Keeping <gasps> nice round numbers. Yes. That's really good. Perfect. Well, that voice that you hear, that is Mr. Robert Cromans. Robert, man, thanks for making the time for us. And listen, my pleasure. I'm always open for a chit chat. You know, you made a comment on the, you know, people used to listen to me a lot, a lot before they see me. I'm actually easier to listen to than look at. <laughs> oh, and a lot of people, I think I mean, the best couple I've ever had, they says you're smarter than you look. And I think that's a great thing, but I use my, image is a little bit of misdirection because I've always had a conversation about business. And the thing I loved about, you know, I know today we're on podcast time, but in those days I made CDs and people would put them in the car and they would listen to it over and over and over again. It's kind of like how you train a dog to sit. You got to say mm -hmm. it a hundred times. And there'd be times I'd be doing seminars. People said, if you fell off the stage, I could repeat verbatim every single word you said. And I know when I started listening to motivational speakers, they had the same effect on me. I used to listen to a very old guy. Uh, his name was Zig Ziglar, and he just blew my mind. He was super funny, very religious, ironically, uh, but he was just an incredible speaker. And I think that, you know, sometimes hearing that repetitive motion of ideas is really important. And I've had a lot of pressure lately. People say, now you're retired. Do you want to do them again? I, I think there's always a conversation of business. And, you know, I look back to my early tapes, the first one I made was called The Art of Making Money. Mm -hmm. And when I look at that today, if I was to open it up and put it on the channel so people could hear it, there's nothing false in that today, 40 years later. 
Mm-hmm. So it's charge more, do more. You know, I think a lot of people are confused by the industry. You see somebody on Instagram saying, I, oh, I get three fifty, dollars you know, I, for color. It all depends on timing. Everybody's a little different. We're not all created equal. According to Jesus, we are. We're not. We all perform at a different level. So it's built on volume or performance. If you want to build a clientele, have a small price, because that's going to give you the experience and the volume you need. My wife is a performer. I don't talk about stage. I mean, she is a performer in the salon. She came home the other day, $1,800 day, average ticket about $350, about $60, $70 bucks on retail or take home. You know, these to me are the things that stand out. And the one thing that I would say that I have changed in my mind, 30, 40 years ago, everything was on commission. Obviously, there was freelance, but everybody was on commission. And I would say, if you had a $3,000 week, I go, well done. There you go. Here's your commission portion. But the thing that nobody ever considered was time. And when California changed the laws a few years ago, they started bringing people into hourly. So I had to equivalent time. So hypothetically, if you had a $2,000 week, if you did it in 25 hours or you did it in 20, your premium would be higher on 20. So the pace of the industry is quite interesting, but I don't think enough hairdressers look at time. (laughs) Some work six, seven days a week, coming in at six in the morning, working all day, having a nice outcome. But if you just try to kind of cross check, if you will, with how many hours did you put into it? How many hours did you put into that corrective color? How many hours did you put into the extensions? I think this will give you a little bit of uh, example of whether you're on the right path or not, because I know for me in California, it's been a huge help. So we've broken the commission bubble. All of my employees are on hourly. Every 13 weeks, we coach them. We assess their numbers and more than often, more than likely they're getting a raise. So they're no longer looking about pushing the commission number. They're looking at, I want to get more hourly. If you were going to buy a car, a commission bracket on your paycheck will not be as powerful as an hourly rate because they can't, you know, I told my mom in Scotland when I got at the hairdressing job, what are you going to make? I said, I don't really know. I think I I got 50% of what? She goes, I don't know nothing. (laughs) You know, you don't know what you're doing. So if I told you you were making $28 an hour, you'd know exactly what that means if you work 20 hours. So that's something that me has changed over the long term. It's not national. It's not all over the country. But Mm -hmm. it's something that I thought was a problem in California when they gave it to me. But it turned out to be a a silver cloud. It's turned out to be very... Robert, Robert, I'm a little confused. So, So... So in California, you can't, so there's not, there's not commission stylist any longer. Uh, if you're going to pay commission, you have to pay double minimum wage plus a smaller commission. So it'd be probably in the seven, eight, 10% category. Hmm. And if you double minimum wage in California, that's already at $34 an hour. So if I got a young kid coming out there and not getting $34 an hour, they're going to start at minimum wage and they're going to work their way up from there. So it's the option is commission can exist as long as you pay double uh, in in the hourly, but I would just say that's unlikely. So we just went for total hours. So if we take your revenue number, we divide it by how many hours you work, and that gives us a number. And you're still using a percentage to work it out. It's the same. It's six and a half a dozen. If I was paying you commission, it'd be the exact same. It's not a differential, Mm -hmm. but it does make a big difference in how people look at things. So if they're coming into work and they don't have clients, they don't really want to be hanging out running the clock because it's going to affect how many hours they put in to hit their number. So it's kind of helped a lot of just people hanging out all the time. Can you give me an example of it? I'm still a little confused by it. So like if if I'm at like a 50%, like in a traditional model, if I'm at like 50% and like, let's say I do $1,000 worth of services for the week, how how does that break down? Well, again, you need the third part of the triangle, which how many hours did it take you? And you see the problem there? People say, oh, I had a $1,500 week. If it took you 73 hours... And you'll be surprised. <laughs> Hairdressers have no concept of time. Wow. That's why we run behind. Mm-hmm. We always take longer than our last client because we can run our mouse a little bit. We have no idea. I mean, you get into highlights, needle and thread, all the types of things that take a lot of time, especially for a young hairdresser. It can take them three hours to put a highlight in. Mm-hmm. Sure. So as much as they think, oh, wow, I had a great day. That was a $300 ticket. If it took them the six hours to get it in, and you, <laughs> you bounce it back. I'm just saying it's a good cross check for every hairdresser, whether you're a freelance hairdresser, whether you're on commission, just cross check with your hours to make sure you're charging appropriately and you're in the right ballpark. Because I don't think people see the value of time. It's a precious commodity. You can't replace it. 
And what I find is I have people that are very efficient on two or three day work weeks being very successful because they really manage their time. They maximize their time in the salon and they have more time off. I have a big passion for working mothers, which I remember 30 years ago, I heard you were having a baby and well, that's over. Uh, the reality <laughs> is a working mother has got focus. She's got that focus for two mm -hmm. days. She wants to get in there. She's not into gossip, not trying to change the world. She wants to do her job and then spend five days a week with her family. And I would say the industry right now after the pandemic is probably part-time. I don't mm -hmm. think I'm putting in the 60, 70 hours that maybe some of us did to get there. When my wife first started working for me, um, she would work 70 or 80 hours a week for a minimal wage. I mean, it wasn't really legal. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It's just that's not the way the young people are coming in. They want that side hustle. They want multiple jobs. So if I get 30 hours a week from a person, that's what I want to maximize. So I see more future and part-time employees coming in. So you may need twice the staff that you may have originally planned on just because you need more people. Having somebody working, you know, seven days a week like we did. And I would just say that I think the young kids have the right idea. Life is too short. Mm -hmm. So why I'd be behind the chair, listening to this stuff. And then, you know, I used to make a T-shirt and I'm sure you may have got one. It's called I Run With Scissors. Now at my age, I have a nice stroll. <laughs> you run to your heart stops and i would just say that hairdressers are the best at a certain amount of clients and then once you go beyond that you start mm -hmm. to hate people you want to choke them with your blow dryer so find the balance that makes you love people mm -hmm. sincerely and that's how many hours you should work a week no more no less because the minute you start not really listening to clients not really loving it not really enjoying it I don't care if you've got to go down to two days a week, one day a week. That's all I work, one day a week. I have the greatest day in my life, one day a week. When I used to do it six days, there's times when I'm like, oh, my God, I can't take anymore. So find the balance. That's the life balance people talk about. And I think it's a kind of important thing. And it kind of goes into that equation of time. Your time's important. What would it mean for you to spend more time with your family, more time in your hobbies, maybe a side hustle, and then this pure energy of the salon. So when you're there, you're present. When you're there, you absolutely want to be there. You're looking forward to every single client in your column. I think these are all things that we got to aim for, not doing so much just because it's required. That's the freedom the young industry want. They don't want to be told what to do, and they don't want all, you know, a, a 50, 40-hour work week is unimaginable. My wife works four days a week. She may get close to the 40 hours, but typically the most average in our company today is 30 hours. Wow. I love all of that. That's what we do. And in my salon, we are actually a hybrid. So we have a little bit of everything here in Florida. We have the hourly, we do the hourly rates, the commission, all of those things. And you really do see the change in the staff. Yeah, You yeah. see them happier. You, you are happier. It's, it's, oh, we even have like booth rentals as well. Like it's a little bit of everything and everybody's just living their best life. Yeah. So, I, I believe hybrid we have hybrid we have three or four legacy employees that got the opportunity to go on it uh we offered it to many and surprising to me most people didn't take it and mm. you know, california i don't know about florida 98 percent freelance 98 percent as you renters if you wish mm -hmm. um which means you know employee kind of types of salons for the future especially in california i don't think are going to happen so i'm very interested in pursuing the hybrid part um i feel you know i'm very fortunate i work with many companies i've worked with sola i've worked with salon republic these are great freelance organizations i also work with supercuts i work with uh sport clips um and what you start to do is kind of understand that there's a certain balance i don't think most people have a full-time clientele so they shouldn't be playing full-time rent mm. so, so we pay we rent by the day yeah, you can take a week of it if you want it. And there's a little bit of break if you take the four or five days. But basically what we're suggesting is take the salon for when you need it. If you need two days, buy two days. Don't buy a week. An average salon in some of these organizations is about four to $500 a week. Mm -hmm. If you're only bringing in a thousand, that makes it 50% of your revenue before you buy color, towels, coffee, or champagne. Yeah. 
So not always being independent is better. I'm just saying sometimes you've got to look at it. So I kind of try to break it down a little bit so that people can have a freedom. In fact, I think I'm going to take this to the to the world just to say, come on into my salon and work a day, a month. Yeah. Come to San Diego. It's 100 yeah. degrees right now. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I've got a beautiful salon. You get the bragging rights of it. And I think it could be an interesting way to pursue a diversified career, which is, I think, what yeah. I've had for 40 years with Paul Mitchell, doing yeah. salon stuff, show stuff, business stuff, everything you can imagine is what stopped me from boring myself to death. Mm. And I think these are kind of critical things that hairdressers need to look at. Looking forward to going out of town for a weekend, working with five or six clients, and you could rent by the day, you know, do whatever you want and travel the world a little bit and see the world. Um, I see a sticker this morning on a guy's car. I said, Guam. I've been to Guam. No way. I've traveled <laughs> six billion miles in my career. So wow. it's a kind of interesting thing when you sort of, understand the lifestyle that is possible for a hairdresser and there's certain little communities that never really get much exposure that you could have a wall in and i would love to see us all traveling around the world working in other folks salons i think that could be quite a beautiful vision robert so um as a business owner when you have all those stations uh in in your building um are you is the goal like if we look at the stations as, as as the employee, is there so much money that each station has to generate? So whether you split that up between three hairdressers or like, like what are your feelings about that? Well, I was on a podcast last week with somebody in a situation and I would say, yeah, maximize your chairs. I have a very large space right now. So I would say that if you came and rented for me from a day, not only going to give you a chair, you can use as many as you want. I have a beautiful color bar with no stations in it. That's got 23 floating chairs We've got 19 styling stations. So to me, it's whatever people want. And I think because of my facility, I can offer that. But I, I think that if I had six chairs, I would just say, what could I do to maximize those? If there was three people paying two days rent a week to use that chair, why not? Um, I think every owner, if you're going to open a business, then you, your job is to maximize the, the revenue. And it, you know, it's a, a beautiful thing. And I would just say the diversity of the business is very critical and it all depends where you live, what your rent is and what type of overhead you're supporting. Right. So uh, my lease is up in this store in May of next year. I can't wait to move to into a smaller facility. I'm going to have to think about it, the whole idea again um, because I'm not going to have the luxury of the space that I currently have. Uh, we have 19 working stations. I would say the greatest concept that we have right now working in our store most people don't read books. So we had this little easel, little plastic thing, and it said, save the date. And it showed you what four weeks from today was, right. six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, nothing to it. And my wife would run to Kinko's every single week. Sometimes she'd send me, and it was becoming a little bit of a pain in her bum. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, I was at a friend's house, and he was, I seen a picture of him in this beautiful frame, and then the picture switched to me and him, and to him and his wife. I go, so it was an LED frame, so in every station, we have this LED frame that has all the collateral of the products that we believe in, the services that we offer, the save the day and all the things. And clients sit there like it's HBO watching it and constantly reacting to what's that? What are you doing in the sink? What type of massage is that? What type of treatment is that? What type of color is that? Asking questions. What hairdresser doesn't want to be asked questions instead of being the person pushing it down their throat? People love it. So it's a beautiful organization. We refresh it once a month. It can be done remotely. Uh, I bought them from Amazon, $50 a piece. And it's probably the smartest thing I've ever done in the last five or six years to bring technology into our businesses. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely So people who have a big screen up front, that's not common knowledge. It's great. It's nice. But when people are sitting there, it's just that one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. uh, they love it. And it's just incredible what you can convey through that. Right now we're doing a lot of scalp treatments. When you see a scalp treatment, you're like, what's that? I want to try mm -hmm. that. If they don't see it, it's like a crazy uncle in the attic. If they don't see it, they don't know what it is. But once they see it, they ask questions. And if you worked for me, somebody goes, oh, what's that? And they go, that's just one of Robert's dumbass ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, they're going to have to go exactly. This is this because you're not going right. to be caught like that. You're going to seem to be an expert. So if we got a new right. product we're launching, uh, we have something right now that's a 
something to do with water and charcoal, but it's in that movie. So people are asking questions. The That's team cool. conditioned on it because they already want to be aware because they don't want a client asking the question that they don't know the answer to. Right. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question uh-huh. that it's going to be a hard pivot <laughs> and be- it's a hard pivot. Pivot. Okay. Okay. All right. So growing up and I would go to the shows and you actually just did it maybe like five minutes into today's call. Uh And I always wanted to know, I said, okay, so I like to keep things real and raw, Robert. Okay. Uh So at the hair shows, you would be on stage, you'd be talking, educating us all. And then you would say, and Jesus loves you and he loves me. And so as a Scotsman, I know you're kind of defaulted to be Presbyterian, most likely. So do you have a relationship with Jesus or is that just for jokes? Yeah, I get caught on this quite a bit. It's really just, I usually say, if you're going to cut hair, you should have a relationship with Jesus. (laughs) Uh, It's not, I don't really have that type of foundation. It just, it's super funny. And I just know that people are religious. So it always got to laugh, but no, I'm not worshiping every single week i'm not against (laughs) anything but uh i would say i'm protestant as my scottish kind of upbringing Mm -hmm. but just funny (laughs) okay no that's fine i would always be like what is going on in there what is happening in robert's little heart what's happening but But anyway thank you people would come up to me later and they would always say this to me and she goes we pray for you. And I always felt like, oh, my God, am I that bad? <laughs> they said, no, it's because we love you. We pray for you. And I thought, well, that's great. And, you know, I just say that as lately going through, that became less and less said because it wasn't as, you know, it's always funny, but it's not always funny to everybody. But nobody knows how I really believe. But mm-hmm. it's interesting you would pick up on it because. Well, yeah, that that has stuck out in my mind for years. And I'm like, if I ever get to talk to him. I'm going to just ask him. And so here we are. So thank you. Um, Another question is what do you feel has been maybe your biggest struggle or your biggest failure? Uh, Well, I would say what what has kept me humble is being a salon owner. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, being a rock star on stage, I find quite easy having a communication about business when you know it. And it's not just what I know through my own experience, it's who I've worked for. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean as an employee, I coach these companies. So the first right. thing they, they got to show me some data that gives me an idea of how they perform so that I have a clue. So I'm very kind of well versed on a lot of different business models. And that really helps me as a guy that wants to speak about it. But I would just say that the salon has always been a, a humble factor. Because is the minute you step on a plane and you're out of town, you don't know what's going on in your business. It's a kind of interesting step. And I would just say that the, the salon is not an easy job. When people say, oh, I'm going to open a salon. I hear it at shows all the time. I'm going to open a salon. I say, where are you going to get your team from? She goes, they're coming with me. I'm like, danger, danger. Uh, yeah. More than ever before, opening a salon today is a tough dream simply because the human resource capital of people is the toughest to get than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying recruitment and retaining uh, team members, the turnover rate in salons overall is quite large. Yeah. So if I had had my business and I've had it for about 30 years or so, if I had retained every single stylist that worked for me, I'd be the richest guy in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I always think about that too. <laughs> yeah, because, and you know what I love? The first thing they'll say to me, it's not personal. We're just kind of going, yeah. I'm like, it's personal to me. Yeah. Uh, you used to live in your car. I, I got you out of that situation. It's always personal. Mm-hmm. And I don't care how many times you hear it. I don't take it as personal. I don't have any vindictiveness towards them. I don't want to sue them. You know, that, you know, you don't want to work here. That's fine. But I'm just saying it's amazing. Some of the people you help the most be, be quick. And, you know, for me, I've been loyal to Paul Mitchell for nearly 40 years. So I've always been a loyalist. I do have employees that work for me for 30 years. Um, how long have you worked there, Mary? For Paul Mitchell or for you? For me. For you, 28 years. 28 years? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there is loyalty, but I'm just saying, I, I think that, I used to go to, I'm going to his birthday party this month in Vegas. And this is one of my favorite owners in the world. I would go to conventions he did and he'd be giving away cars. 
and not like a you know BMWs and stuff. Sundays in that one of his giveaway parties, five or six cars. He had profit share that people were making sometimes three hundred thousand dollars a year, and he still had turnover. Wow! This is a salon owner. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. But Robert, is it is is there is it? I don't know how to put this question, but is it fair to think that someone that you get right out of hair school that they're going to stay with you forever? I mean, there's no there's no mm -hmm. other example really. I mean, kind of like kind of that that model is dead even in even in the corporate world there is no like blue yeah. chip jobs anymore so is it so is it kind of an unfair expectation as a salon owner that you'll, you'll keep somebody forever uh, i wouldn't say that my expectation is to keep them forever I, I think that you know the the stick power every time you move a salon you're gonna lose half your clients mm. so you're mm -hmm. perpetually building so I would, if I was going to leave a salon, I would look at my indicators to tell me if I was doing the right thing. Are you 70 or 80% in demand? Because that way you have more power to move. But if I'm 40% in demand and I move and I lose half of that, I've now got 20% clientele and I have a rent of $1,600 a month. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's just being knowledgeable. I'm not saying it's right. There are certain individuals, like my, my wife said to me, I love you, but I'm going to go rent somewhere. I know she has the numbers to support it. She's got the loyalty to support it. It's not it, just different strokes for different folks. Mm -hmm. Some people need sometimes the alignment of having somebody behind them to help them push ahead. I think that's mm -hmm. why I've done so well in the industry. I had a lot of people believed in me. So I think that's the key. And I would just say that right now, because the minimum wage is so high, we're not hiring so many young kids out of school. We're looking at the industry a lot different. I used to have some nice 10, 12 assistants at one time building our future team. And we don't really do that as much. Uh, we had three or four. I obviously invested some during COVID because we lost so many. Uh, but it didn't all turn into gold. It sort of was, yeah, they were there. So even though I hired eight, I kept maybe two at the end of it. And they're they're killing it because I think most people need somebody just guiding them somewhere. Mm -hmm. You take a train off the tracks, it doesn't go anywhere. So the people that we've got, I've got one right now. She'll be upset if I don't mention her. Her name's Alex. Uh, <laughs> oh, hey, Alex. I, I hired her from Paul Mitchell to school. She was a Cosmo barber. And I started off in one of my little salons. And she is just breaking every record, going further and further. The more Mary coaches, the more we coach. She's got it. And I know that she, I used to say to her, I said, I know right now you're 19, 20, but do you want to make 20 year old money or 30 year old money? Mm -hmm. And she's now sort of got it and she's getting rewards. She's getting promotions. She's got the hang of it. I think that's what people need. A lot of people need guidance and it doesn't come from the internet and it doesn't come from just taking coaching you here on the internet and going, oh, I'm going to use that. Uh, everybody's got a different life. Mm -hmm. you know. So you've got to kind of, Pick your mentors and coaches. I love you. Use the word coach. Uh, there was a thing called Clubhouse that was big during COVID. I loved it. Yes. <laughs> so did I. I remember that. <laughs> I was the mayor of Clubhouse, but on one of the guys' profiles, he did. It wasn't even a hairdresser group, but he didn't know how to spell coach, so he wrote couch. Oh <laughs> no! So when I was doing seminars around there, I said, "I, I want to be your couch." <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, if you're, gonna couch. Emulate, if you're going to emulate somebody, you want to know exactly that you've got apples to apples type business. Yeah. It's like when you hear the word percentage of retail, that's got to be apples to apples. Only if you're charging the same price as another person, does that percentage really come into play? So to me, find a business that's apples to apples, find somebody in a career that's exactly what you're trying to do. And those people make great coaches for you. And, you know, there's so many ideas out there. We've never been short of ideas as an industry, but it's about the giddy up and getting the ambition to do it. We're all motivated. I've been motivated for years to go to the gym, but never taken my fat ass there once. <laughs> so it's a case of what's going to drive you. And sometimes it's people who drive you to make you do impossible things. And that's yeah. what I like to do in people's lives. Make them do things they didn't know they could do. And then when they've done it, they go, wow, it's a lot easier than yeah. I thought. Yes, it is. But you've got to apply yourself and you've got to be consistent with it, you know, so that makes a big difference. So what's an insult, whether personal or professional, that you have gotten that you are currently so proud of? That you look back and you're like, wow, I'm happy about that. I get a lot of homeless stuff. What? Homeless? homeless? Yeah. Okay. I don't understand. Yeah, this doesn't make sense. Elaborate. 
well, when my wife and I were dating, I was going to take a car to go rendezvous with her somewhere. And I was on a corner and this homeless guy was just going crazy. And I just ignored him. And then I listened in and he's like, this is my corner. So <laughs> homeless people come up to me all the time. Uh, sometimes I'll see a client trying to come into my salon. I'll go out and say, hey, and she'll like hold herself. She thinks I'm a homeless guy trying to make a buck. <laughs> So I don't really hate it. I, it's kind of like, you know, I'm bringing homeless back. I don't really care. I like, I, when I take my clothes to my dry cleaners, there's a big hole in that. I go, oh, yeah, I bought it that way. Uh, <laughs> I kind of look that I go for. And, you know, the whiskers and all the stuff, you know, it's just to kind of look to. So, you know, I don't Did think you ever go it, pick your stuff up at the dry cleaners and the hole was mended? No, no, no. no. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't use that dry cleaners. No, I have very particular <laughs> clothes. That would be We've fine. seen. I think it's great. I, you know, I'm always like, oh, it's Robert the pirate. He's, he's talking right now. I gotta go. I gotta go see this. I get so. the pirate thing quite a lot, and I did. Thank you, Johnny Depp, for that. I did love him. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I did love the movies, but I did sort of have that sort of pirate hat image. And um, again, I think that no matter what, you're trying to lure people in. And when mm -hmm. I go to a show, like you mentioned, you met me in Orlando. People see me walking by and go, who the heck is that guy? I want to mm -hmm. go see what he's about. So whether I'm an idiot or a, a, you know, a guy that really knows how to run his mouth, which is the case, people come to my shows and are actually very surprised by me. Uh, I once did a big convention and the guy said, the whole time I was in the audience, I couldn't look at you. He said, but then I listened to everything you said and I thought you were just the most profound individual I've ever met. And I want to apologize for judging you. Everybody wants to judge a book by the cover. Yeah, I think That's the thing I try to sort of do. I use my image for a certain thing and it lures you in. And then you're actually quite surprised when you actually hear some truth coming out of it. And it makes a big difference. And I would just say that it's a rite of passage. You don't just mm -hmm. come up looking like a pirate and then all oh, the people are going to come see me. If they do, you, they'll be disappointed that you may not have anything to say. <laughs> so it's been an evolution of the Bob. It didn't just yeah. come out this way. I didn't leave beauty school this way. <laughs> Over time, I evolved, got stronger, stronger, got a little weirder, got a budget. <laughs> <laughs> a weird budget. But, you know, cool. At the end of the day, I try to, honestly, I have a beautiful heart. I'm a beautiful man. I really love people. Mm -hmm. I love hairdressers. I, you know, you talked about having a photograph, Christine. I've had more photographs taken long before there was Instagram, when people had the little yeah. wind up camera. Yes, yes. I would be at shows and there'd be a line, as you would think it was for the restroom and it was for a picture. So I, I always take pictures. I've always done it. It's always been a way I close the show. I'm always one of those artists that when I'm on a big show, I leave through the front of the house. I'm not a backstage guy and off in my tour bus. I, I just think if you love hairdressers, you know, I say this all the time, if you love hairdressers, tell your face. Uh, it, it's sincerity. And I think why yeah. I had a great reaction with people is they could feel it, whether they agreed with everything I said, like the hair I did. Uh, one of my best buddies said, Robbie, you don't even need to do hair. They just want to listen to you. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a combination of things. And I think that I see lots of great talent on the horizon. There's people up there that can do a lot of things that I could do. Uh, I think that somebody said to me one day, thanks for bringing rock and roll back to the industry. I go, when was it here yeah. the first time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Robert, you, um, you, I mean, we're 30 minutes in and all we've talked about is your bit. What, what the hell does retirement look like for you? Cause it doesn't well, sound like it. <laughs> yeah, definitely you, does not. Well, I'm going to just, what you said at the top of the show, and we'll just repeat what we said before we turned the cameras on. Uh, Mary find me a new side hustle in Italy being a gondola. <laughs> I, also, <laughs> and I'm going to be driving the gondola, telling jokes the whole way through. My wife does speak Italian. I'm learning a little bit because I do feel like I'd like to live in Italy. I really do. Uh, but I know at the top of the show, you retired from the industry. I have not retired from the industry. I've retired from Paul Mitchell. Now, um... whether I stay in the industry, whether I, I mostly what I'm looking at, what's going on when I'm looking at social media, all I'm seeing is what I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. When I'm a kid, all I've seen is who I did want to be. So these people are very helpful to me because they're showing me, like, okay, I don't want to do that. That's not where I want to go. Uh, do I want a product line? Yeah. Somebody said to me, you, you, wouldn't it be nice to have your name on a bottle of shampoo? I once had my face on a pair of panties. <laughs> that was more rewarding <laughs> than my name on a bottle of shampoo. 
And, you know, I just think that everybody's got different ambitions in the industry. I put 40 years into Paul Mitchell. I loved him from beauty school. I was a believer. Before I was a leader, I was definitely a believer. I was just walking on whatever Paul told us to do. I also had the great fortune to work with Paul Mitchell. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Mr. Angus Mitchell, who we lost mm -hmm. beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. That had a huge impact on me because he was my buddy. We both had one thing in common. We loved his father. And mm -hmm. he told me just before he passed that I reminded him of his dad. And that couldn't be a better compliment received. And I'm just saying that is a big loss to the industry because he had a beautiful heart. He loved mm -hmm. hairdressers. We had a lot in common. But I'm just saying I'm not quite sure what the next chapter is. I'm taking a bit of time off. Um, my wife's still working hard, diligently traveling the world with Paul Mitchell. Um, so we're not against that. We're still a Paul Mitchell 100% salon. So nothing's really changed except I've got a pause. And for the first time in my life, I can have thoughts that not necessarily are about JP or Paul that are just about, you know, what do I want to do? Uh, I could start, you know, I love to cook. I love to do certain things. I mean, who knows what? Uh, I do enjoy coaching, so I may sort of turn into that, but I just feel the internet has changed everything. Uh, in 1980 and 90, to see a hair show, you had to be there. Mm -hmm. To see Paul Mitchell, you had to be there. To see Vidal mm -hmm. Sassi, you had to be in the room. And mm -hmm. now the digital format, you can be from your phone seeing such incredible talents from all over the world, people you may never meet, and be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. So I just think the industry has shifted quite considerably. But I appreciate the technology because as a creator that's building shows and different things, it's so beautiful to be pulling these assets so that when you're telling people about the show you're going to do, it's not in your head. You've got visualized like a storyboard, a mood board. Here's how the hair is going to look. Here's how the fashion is going to look. Here's how the music's going to look. And I just think that's the way to create for the future. So I'm not sure, you know. People say I'm an incredible showman. So obviously that's still in me. I'm still looking at shows and going, oh my God, I could do something with that. Mm -hmm. I love music. I listen to TikTok every day. <laughs> and that gives me the sense. And you know, people say at my age, you don't watch TikTok. You could be on Facebook or MySpace. But to me, I just love that I can spot a trend like that one, what uh, Abaracadabra, the Barbara one, or <laughs> my money don't fold it, jiggle jiggles or wiggle wiggles, whatever that is. You spot these little things and I think that makes it kind of interesting. So when I would put yeah. music together for a show in Europe, every little track I had, Pretty Girls Walk Like This, I knew it was going mm. to hit because the music, and sometimes I let other people hear and they go, what's that? And I go, mm -hmm. I no, what I know. If I'm in schools and I drop a line of one of these songs, they all relate to me. And my wife's like, what is that? I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. So I'm just saying for a man of my age, it's incredible the inspiration I'm getting every day on my phone, but TikTok, Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, there's no limitation. Uh, it's just a beautiful place to be in the industry. So if you're a young individual in the industry, I think you have it better than I had it. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I had mentors. I had to go and physically be in the room to see them. But these days, I think it's possible to have mentorship around the world, mm -hmm. of people you may never see, maybe they may, may never meet, but they can influence you incredibly. And uh, I enjoy that point of the industry right now. I think it's the most fascinating time we've ever been in. 100%. So we were talking about retirement. We're, we we did mention Angus. Uh -huh. How do you feel that retirement maybe is your nourishment, like for your well-being, for your mental state of all of, of Angus's sudden passing? I know it definitely had an effect on me because I hang out with his beautiful wife mm -hmm. and I just felt while well, I'm talking to her, giving her advice, I find I was actually talking to myself. Mm. Was my motivation that still happened. there? Was I so excited? Because the sort of career that I had built myself into, because I'm the global art director of the company, so my vision was really taking a lot of time in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's what him and I were doing. We we're going to Zurich. We were going to Italy. We were going to Germany. We were going all over Europe. And our company's not as big there. So a lot of it was to really propel the needle, move the needle. In the United yeah. States, we pretty much have ownership here with the number one hair care brand in the world. Yes. So a lot of my vision was me and my buddy, our wives, go into these incredible shows where they treat us like rock stars. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, they really do. They're so appreciative, so amazing. So it was definitely a question. I think whenever you see death, and I think this industry's seen a lot of death lately, mm -hmm. you got to question it because it could be you. And are you doing the things that you should be doing because you just don't know? So I think that was a part of it. And then, you know, I'm a 62-year-old man. And I've been doing it. I've got, if you were buying me as a car, I've got a lot of mileage. Uh, I've been everywhere. I've done every type of show I've ever dreamed of. Um, I came off a show stage once and Vidal Sassoon pulled me over and said, you're the greatest showman I've ever seen. And I think I could, I could take that one and go, all right. Who's yes, who's take it. 100%. And yeah. So I feel like I've accomplished a lot in the industry. And then the next chapter, who knows what it was for me and Angus, it was playing around doing the things we love. And then it'll come to me with this time off I'm having, uh, you know, every day people are asking me, I'm just not sure what it is. And, you know, one of my colleagues at Paul Mitchell came driving down on his motorcycle and said, you know, I was at a job for 40 years, just like you were. He worked for Vidal Sassoon. Mm -hmm. Um, the company changed, something happened, I got laid off, and I right away took another job out of desperation. And I said, well, okay, that's interesting. He says, you should take six months off and just chill. And I said, well, you're talking to the right guy because I know how to chill. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a chill pill. So I'm not so, ah, let me run out and do this. I know as a hairdresser, I can make a living no matter what. And I think I'm excited to revamp our salon. I'm always working on the concepts of it. But um I'm happy to chill out and then it'll come to me. It'll come. There'll be a, a void or something I see, which is a place where I could be useful. I'm not just trying to be another guy doing what everybody else is doing. I think it, you know, it's important to do something that gives me the same passion that I've held in my body for 40 years for Paul Mitchell. I can't do it half. I can't see me up on stage with another company going, oh, these guys are the greatest ever because I've kind of used up all my credibility. When I walk <laughs> in Europe, people go, there's the Paul Mitchell guy. Yeah. I hear that compliment all the time. I'm never offended because I'm quite honored to be affiliated with that. But that would be really weird if you see me on stage at Matrix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be very confusing. So I just think that, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm not quite sure, as I say, I have a lot of experience. I have a lot of things. Obviously, when my retirement was announced, a lot of people want to chat. Um, I'm very excited about talent in the industry. So who knows? It could be building shows with other talents, which is what I do when I work for Paul Mitchell's, you know, kind of helping bring in the talent you normally wouldn't see and giving you a main stage performance of an all day episode that you cannot forget to the day you die. Uh, so I've had a few people from some of the trade shows that have been interested in getting me back onto the stage and being more of an MC or maestro, doing a little bit of hair if necessary. Uh, I just think, you know, and I don't really, you know, I've been selling two for 22 for 40 years. I don't necessarily want to be a <laughs> pitch on moving the deal sheet. I've done that. Mm -hmm. And most people, when they've ever watched me and they buy our stuff, it's not because I'm selling it. It's just they love it so much. Like whatever you're selling, I'm taking. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to sell thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars in t-shirts and they were just little gags like one said quit your bitching you did it in the kitchen <laughs> best seller uh it was really a kind of approach and a, a defense against drugstore color mm -hmm. so you know i just feel that i don't think there's a part of the beauty industry i've left to go oh my god if i could have just done that one thing yeah. i've sat on Vidal's lap twice nobody can even say that <laughs> Uh, it just, I've been gifted. I got to work with yeah. Paul Mitchell. I've been everywhere. I know every major artist in the world. They're all beautiful friends of mine. I just don't know if there's any more for this. I'm not quite sure. But as I say, I'm not, I'm retired for Paul Mitchell, but I'm not quite sure what the universe is going to present itself to. I, I actually, I think that that's great news. Like, like I'm mm -hmm. so happy that you're still representing the industry because, yeah. you know, from, 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 you know, just your, your business knowledge and, and your just creativity. I mean, the wash house and the color bar and, and all of that, that you brought that to the industry. So, so I'm, I'm so, I, I'm so happy to hear that, like, that's going to continue. You know, that, that's awesome. You brought up a couple of times, like people that you're watching, who, who online are you watching? That's really firing you up. Ooh. You can't say Mary. I just saw you make eye contact with her. <laughs> yes. so Mary, who else in the industry is firing you up? The one lady I love her, the way she cuts her, Jane. 
Jane Edo Salon. I don't know her true last name. I know. But... Jane Edo is her name. She cuts these beautiful little shaggy curtain bangs with a razor. Not really. Uh, she's not. I wouldn't call her a precision hair cutter, uh, but she does just beautiful transformation. She's one I definitely would pay money. And that's how I'm sort of looking at if I was to build a super show, it'd be people that I would pay money to watch. Mm -hmm. I used to say that, but one of my platform partners, I would pay money to watch this kid cut hair. And I just know that there's certain people, some that I actually worked with colleagues at Paul Mitchell that are incredible. Sure. Uh, the one I was kind of talking about from Sassoon, Stephen Moody. He's just the greatest teacher I've ever seen. And I'm pretty good at it. He's just <laughs> incredible and he's got passion. So, you know, looking at different people that you see out there and, you know, some can be motivational, some may be quiet because, you know, what I kind of represent in my show is I'm a mouthpiece. So you can be a visible artist, just get your head down and do magical work, which is a beautiful thing. And sometimes if you're a platform artist on a big stage, people could think you're a little dull and boring because you're not running the words, telling the jokes. Uh, I used to work with a guy. I said, if he, if I cut hair like him, I wouldn't tell jokes either. <laughs> <laughs> it's more a reference of how I do it. I got to entertain because that's what the job is. But to me, if you can create visible artistry and you've got a work in line that's creating a bit of fun and magic, I, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. So almost like if you watch the Olympics, like the you know, the beautiful basketball thing when you've got all these incredible players, look what can be done. And I just think that could be something I could do because a lot of people, which surprises me something, I've had an influence on a lot of folks out there. And mm -hmm. sometimes when I'm, yeah, I think you said fangirling. Totally. Uh, it's a great day. <laughs> I'll see somebody I know, like there's one, I think he's from the UK, Josh Lamonaco. He's a male hairdresser, but he does women's shapes too. But I've never seen anybody take such detail and such incredible craftsmanship and put it to work on a man's head or a gentleman's head. And I remember I was at a thing for Hairbrand and I see him there and I go, oh, let me go and just say hi. I go, hey, I, I'm, and I went to say who I was. He goes, you're Robert Cromings. Can I get a picture? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so there's people that I don't even really know. Sometimes if we're at a show, Mary's like telling me who they all are with their hashtags. I don't necessarily know them. But there's, without a doubt, people that know me. Uh, I remember meeting the legendary Guy Tang. Somebody oh. said, you know Guy Tang? I said, I don't know Guy Tang. But when I met him at a show, he just collapsed in my arms and <laughs> hugged me and said, the first hair show I ever seen was with you and Stephanie Kachowski. Uh, we have influenced people yeah. on the ground, on the world. And most people, when I really get around them, say, oh, my God, the first time I was ever at a show, it was you I watched. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying we've had an influence. I used to love doing the trade shows. It was such a great place to be. Mm -hmm. And it kind of teaches you how to be a busker, how to pull a crowd from nothing. People say, mm -hmm. well, it's because you're famous. No, long before I was famous, I was able to get a crowd's interest and hold them there all day. And that's something that is really critical. And, you know, some people cut hair and nobody's watching. Well, you're boring. I'm sorry. You've got to bring more to it. Bring more to it. It's not a, a real, people don't want to be bored. And especially mm -hmm. now it's moving faster and faster. The thing you got to love about TikTok is the short format, the short edit. Mm -hmm. Because in nine seconds, they tell you where they're from and all this stuff. Whereas people tend to talk too much, too many words, not enough meaning. So it's really one of those things that if you really get into show business, it's about how do you edit a show and make it just pack, 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 pack? And that's the magic. So when I did big shows, that's what I was able to do. I'm also really good at threading up a team. So even if somebody said to me, I've never been on stage before, I said, you don't have to worry. If I'm up there, it's like a safety net. Mm -hmm. Nothing can go wrong. Your model faints, the color tray falls over. Even the lights going out, I can overcome. There's nothing mm -hmm. I can't overcome. I actually used to pray for a little bit of some disaster through a show because that's <laughs> I'm witty and smart and clever uh -huh. and you get off the script. Because I think the danger that people are running into right now is they're too scripted, too mm -hmm. organized. I can see it coming. It's like telling a joke. I can hear the punchline long before you delivered it. And I think that's a big thing that people need to learn. It's got to feel organic. It's got to be is that, real. Is that, is that, is that, is that also part of the brand fault? Because the brand, they, they dictate so much of what you can say when you're on the stage, when you're representing them. Oh yeah. Because you know, in nineteen, it's not fault, but it's like how we're being trained. If I had said something that wasn't true of the brand in nineteen ninety, nobody would ever have noticed. But nowadays, if you filmed it, put it on the Instagram, and then suddenly 
Yeah. So the fact checking of it, yeah, it's it's a whole different <laughs> part. And you know, I give my wife incredible credit because she knows everything about Paul Mitchell. And you know, by default, I did too. So even though I would be training people, making sure they knew the ingredients, kakadu, pea peptides, and all this stuff, I know it too. So if I know it, you got to know it. So I think it's important, but I just think that many companies, once they get kind of big at it, there's a script, there's a thing. And then I just feel like I could see it coming. It's very slow. It's very, it just doesn't feel that it should feel just like the first time. It should feel like a first kiss. It should feel like you've never said that before. And I think that's a big part that people could learn, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, train platform artists, because I think there's a lot I watch when I see them going, oh, no, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> Uh, you know, just I watch people do stuff, say stuff, you know, when they're cutting hair, I'm cutting hair like this because I don't want that. Why are you telling people what you don't want? Mine can only work on one piece. Tell what, them what, what you do. What, 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 mm. what, uh, what's been your biggest onstage disaster? Oh, that's such a good question, Corey. Well, what was that one? Would it be someone fainting on you? They were early in my career. Uh, there's a product we made that Paul made. It's called Sculpting Lotion. And it's a liquid, sure. very liquidy. In fact, when you would put it on hair, you would sort of pepper it in. So this is probably my first show ever. <laughs> and I go to grab this little product and I start peppering it in. I think I'm doing great. I've got maybe 400 people in the audience. And I was kind of giving it a little finger wave. And I start finger waving. And as I started waving it, I started to see a lather. So I'd actually not lifted sculpting. I'd lifted shampoo. Mm -hmm. And right as the time I'm sort of going, okay, I see it. I look out to the audience and I could tell they've seen it. So I claimed it. <laughs> this is the big learning. Claim it. And I was working with a partner. I was the junior kid in this team. And I said, I'm so sorry. I'll never do that again. She goes, it was hilarious. Do it the next show. Mm. And that same lady I worked with, her name was Jean Bra. She did long hair, beautiful stuff. For 10 years, I passed pins. One model in some beautiful show in Kansas City, this model fainted. And when people faint on stage, everybody just loses their mind. She needs some orange juice. Well, eventually somebody gave her orange juice. They started to carry her off stage. And it's my job to pick it back up. And I said, I hate when that happens in the salon. I feel so bad going through their wallet. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole room laughed. And then suddenly, whoa. So, you know, things go wrong. Uh, but to me, it's how you handle it. And then being honest. You know, mm. if it's wrong, just call it. Oops, didn't mean that. That didn't go right. Uh, as opposed to trying to hide it and scurry it away. I just think sometimes just calling out before they do is kind of a good secret. You know what? See. That was that was even behind the chair. That was one of my biggest learns, and it took me until I was in my thirties, very much in my thirties, before I felt comfortable enough to be like, I fucked up. You know, like like I messed this up, and like you know. But what I noticed though is that your clients don't necessarily get mad when you make a mistake, and you're a genius when you know how to fix it. You know, I mean, literally yeah. just two years ago it was during the Christmas bash and you know it's a rule that i live by like take the one eighth of a second that it takes to actually read the formula i mean to read the color on the tube as opposed to what box it came out of right and 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 sure enough man like my 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 ash level seven ended up being a five red violet you know and the, and of course it's the christmas rush but you know we we're able to recover it and luckily she's still my client and and i had to cancel my whole day and stuff but it's much better just to own like I messed up. Robert, I need a favor. And I don't think Christine's ever heard this story. So I oh. need to tell her the story. Okay. And you brought up like going through someone's wallet. Can you tell Christine the time that you were delivering pizzas and you lost your wallet and you also lost some other uh, stuff? Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm well, so excited to hear the story. Well, I was probably about 24 years old. I just moved from Scotland. And the first thing I did when I pretty much got here is I went to beauty school. And it was in beauty school, they carried Paul Mitchell products. So that's where I fell in love. Mm -hmm. Watched a video, Paul Mitchell, he's Scottish, I'm Scottish. He thought he was funny. I think I'm funny. <laughs> and, and when I watched him do hair, he was like a wizard. He did just impossible things, not conventional whatsoever. So to go through beauty school, just like many people did, I had another job. I delivered pizza and I went to school in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, one evening we got an order for a large pepperoni pizza, which I popped in my car and off I went. 
And when I got there, the guy, which happens sometimes, they would wait outside. So just to kind of cut away, finding the house or whatever, I'd just be outside. Okay. So I see the guy waiting. So I was like, oh, there he is. I jump out with a pie. He goes into his pocket. I think he's going to bring out his wallet. He brought out a gun. Oh, Lord. And he pointed it at me, and I could hear it wobble and woggle a little bit, but I'd never really seen a gun, so I gave him the benefit. <laughs> He said, give me the pizza, which I handed over. He said, give me whatever money you have, which again, it was Domino's, so I handed over the money. But the third thing he said, he said, take your pants off. And I got a little spot and said, hell no. And he hit me on top of the head with a gun, and I could feel the weight of a Magnum 357. So as I lay on the ground with no pants on, I thought to myself, <laughs> start wearing underwear. Mom was right. <laughs> Stop it right now. But the second thing, which is more important, was to really make beauty skill pay off, to really apply myself yeah. to win through the tribulations, the trials. But you can imagine when I tell the story, as a young man coming from Scotland, I'm laying there, you take my pants off. I'm thinking, what's this guy going to do to me? It was really <laughs> to turn to stop me chasing after him. Uh, but as it turned out, it was a really fun story. And I've told it like a hundred times and it never gets old. I have no problem telling the same jokes over and over again, but you yeah, got to commit to them. You got to commit yeah. every single time. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful experience and it did put me on my way because I did apply myself. I told people in school that I went to that I would get more out of beauty school in this particular school than anybody else ever did. And I used to meet my old learning leaders or teachers years later and they say, Oh my God, we knew when you were in school, oh. you were going to oh. do it. So it's just one of those things that, you know, it, it seems like a great story when you look at it now, but at the time I just applied myself in the right ways, believed in something. I think it's mm -hmm. something easier to believe in something than it is to believe in yourself. And eventually that belief in yourself comes through. So, mm -hmm. you know, a, a beautiful experience for me. And um, even kids I went to beauty school with, I'd meet them later at shows and they go, I, I would see you and I knew you were going to be so I said well what would make you think that he said yeah. you would use Paul Mitchell products on your little old ladies in school oh you bought it out your own pocket I said what did that make you think he said I wished I had people got to commit to something yeah pokey, pokey. you got to put yourself in yeah and yeah you'd be surprised what comes out of it and I think that's where a lot of people you know they try something once and then stop it like you got to believe so when you bring up religion, people believe in religion. you got to believe mm -hmm. in something. And I just think for me, I was very convincing. And when you're, if you're convinced, you'll be convincing. Yeah. So if you pitch something and you don't really believe it, I can see that you are faking yourself here. You've got to be convinced to be convincing. And when that happens, then you're a natural organic speaker. You're just telling people what you did yesterday in the salon. And that's your story of sale. And yeah. that's what I like. I like people that are, living it and walking it uh, over mm -hmm. people who have just read the book or the poster or the, the technical savvy, you know, mm -hmm. it's about your own testimony. And I think that's a critical thing from even clients. People don't want to hear how good I am. They want to hear a client tell you how good I am. Yeah. So it's testimony. And that's what the whole world needs now, more and more testimony. And I think for artists and teachers and coaches, I think it's drawing from your own experience. And if you've had that experience, it's very easy to be convincing. So I know time is passing by, but what is something that, you know, you wish that we would have asked you that we didn't and how would you have answered it? What kind of husband are you? Yeah. What kind of husband am I? <laughs> Robert, what kind of husband are you? I'm a great kisser. <laughs> You shake your head, yes. No. Of course you are. <laughs> I I am I am a very good husband, only because I was very clear on what I wanted. And um, you know, I knew I was going to a show somewhere and I was a little lost and people were taking care of me. That was a beautiful part of my life. But Mary put her arm in my arm and I just knew that was it. It was over. Aww. And uh we've been together now coming up on 18 years. And we've been married for five, but we get along really, really well, even though we work together. If we're doing shows, I'm at the front of the house building the show. She's backstage doing all of the magical stuff that it takes to produce 30 models. But um, we also are very, we don't say stupid shit to each other. Oh, we don't well, that's good. Say, 
We don't ever say something that you can't retract. A lot of people don't know this. I was with one of my friends. I'm going to keep his name out of it just to protect him. But he told his wife to shut up. Oh. And, and my wife said, I will punch you in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I had no idea because he was a little older. And I'm just saying, these days with pronouns and different things, I don't care what age you are, you got to be, you got to represent the people. And if you're going to represent the people, you got to be aware of the different terms and the things that are going on. But for Mary and I, we may, I'm sure sometimes she must just go, oh my God, this guy's an idiot. But she's never said it to my face. <laughs> and I think that's the thing that keeps our relationship beautiful. We don't say yeah. things right later even if there's alcohol involved i mean it's just like an email or something you'd write on a post once mm -hmm. you put it there you can't retract it so i find that when mary and i started being together and the love that we show and not just when we're you know with friends at shows we had a lot of friends like angus mitchell that wanted mm -hmm. the same sort of love that we had and a lot of my friends Aww. rearranged their lives to fall in love the same way we had and live the same sort of life especially when people are mentors to an industry mm. they deserve happiness so when i see a mentor to the industry being miserable in a marriage i'm like no nah, buddy you gotta change this because you give too much to too many people and yeah. when you do that i just want the best for you and i think that's what happened with me and mary and i think that's what we identified with when we had our wedding the only people that were there were people that were in love with their partners their spouses and all the different things and uh, people still talk about the wedding, how great it was. It's just that was the nucleus that we built upon. And like, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's really important as an industry, certainly um, not to genderify it, but uh, to genderify it. I think it's really important that us as men represent what uh, what a married, what a happy married life can look like. Because certainly coming up uh, in the industry in the '90s, um, w when I did, there wasn't a lot of representation about that. As a matter of fact, it was an incredibly misogynistic and 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 toxic masculinity kind of stuff. Now, you know, there was sex, drugs, and rock and roll that went with all that as well um but 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 I, I i'm hopeful that moving forward as an industry that we can have more positive stuff i am a much much better husband now but i had to learn how to be a good husband right there was a lot of years until i was in my mid-30s where i wasn't a very good husband you know and not like not with cheating and stuff like that that's never been my thing but i certainly said and did things that 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 i do regret saying and doing um but but now now you know pretty much since my mid-30s and i decided that that i was going to end that part of my life um you know we've had an incredibly happy and, and good marriage um but i'm just so glad to see that somebody with with the platform that you have mm -hmm. is representing that and not even like in, in representing it in a sense of like standing in front of it like like yeah this is who i am you know, and and no matter who I was, this is who I am. And and, and this is and, and I just I appreciate you. And as you know, I adore Mary. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but but I, I talked her up before the, before the thing like she like really humbled me when, when we first met. And, and I, I, I'm a I'm very appreciative that that um, that that the three of us met and got to spend that time together in the salon, whether you remember or not, Robert, we spent some time. I, I remember. I remember. <laughs> after a long show so it was a late little wee hour stuff so we did yaya's hair at the salon yeah we had well no the last time we talked but when you did with mary uh we were uh that was a dtc in dc yeah. yeah i did yaya's hair I stole that show by the way of course you uh, did uh, this beautiful girl her name was yaya of course it was uh butt length hair mary made it pink and i cut it off in about three minutes and the crowd went <laughs> Every artist I was working with was like, what just happened? I said, you've just been an artist. <laughs> they, there, was, there was five artists up there. They didn't color the hair. Some of them were dry cutting, which I mean, there is a place for dry cutting, but it's not what I see is what I see. Mm -hmm. Transformation is the game. Change, risk taking. And I'm afraid these are just the way it works. If you don't take a risk, you don't get a reward. So mm -hmm. we had a good time there. But, you know, I would just say that I was part of that 80s, 90s thing, and it was a male-driven industry. You weren't seeing a lot of female talent, and that's not true of today's market. You're seeing a little bit more mixture, and I think there's as many female heroes as there are male heroes, but there was a time it was just, if you weren't a guy, you weren't having success on a platform, to be quite honest. To mention females, we're going to be maybe on one hand of mm -hmm. the females that made a difference. That is not the way it works these days. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a very positive shift. 
I, I think that, you know, I think it's unique because men are a minority in this industry and in, in America. Yeah. But when I do shows in Italy, it's all male. When I'm in Israel. Oh, wow. You know, oh, yeah. It's a whole different energy when you're doing a show. Like the shirtless boy doesn't do so well in Italy. <laughs> 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 it's just a very interesting thing. I think, again, part of my philosophy as a showman is begin with the audience in mind. So if I'm in a situation where I happen to know the audience is male, I'm going to play a slightly different game. And I just think that, you know, when you look at a show, when I go into a showroom, I sit in the back of the room and I just visualize the whole thing. A lot of people, I see them go up on these big stages. I call it death by stage because you don't have any idea in fact, most of the shows I do, if I'm on a big stage, I can't wait to get off of it and get in the crowd because mm. it really creates this invisible line between you and them. All a stage is doing is creating distance. And I break that barrier. So these people build stages with no stairs. I still jump off of it because I know if there's 6,000 people there, if I don't go to the back row, it's not going to be the same thing. People want to feel something. Mm. So I love getting off the stage. I do business seminars. I sometimes don't even take the stage. It's not the place to be. Why do I want to create distance? I want to walk around. Mm -hmm. So if you're dumb enough to sleep in my audience, you'll know about it. Find <laughs> <laughs> you with a balloon. Uh, it's just one of those things. So even when you've got people that are resisting you and not wanting to play, as soon as you take away that invisible line, you're in the crowd and suddenly there's a whole different thing and you're touching people, you're engaging in people, taking questions. No longer is that, that distance, that sort of artificial big platform, little you. It's taken away that invisible line, if you can. Even at trade shows, I used to do this trick where people would gather around and they would leave this kind of about you know 12 feet empty because they didn't want to get too close. And I would lie to them and say, the fire marshal came by. He said, you got to come in. I'd bring him in, bring him in. They'd get right up to And then I'd build another crowd on top. And then you couldn't get out even if you wanted to. So everything I do is very technically driven through years of experience of doing it. It's not just being a natural. Uh, I think I'm a natural person at certain things, but mm. everything I have is experience. What I was told by Vidal is the greatest showman in the world is because I'm on stage more than most people. Uh, mm. I'm in audiences more than most people. I speak business more than most people. And that's really what comes out of me and knowing all these little things that I kind of learn when I walk into a room, what I see, what I think about, where the audience are, you know, what are the production team like? The last thing, I people go into these big shows, they're building this incredible production like it's a grand event, and the, the guys are working with 12 other teams. They don't have the capacity. So just keeping it simple sometimes when it's necessary and having the kind of common sense to do those things. But, you know, I'm definitely going to miss the shows, mm. miss the trade shows. I've been missing those already because I had such yeah. fun at trade shows. I think if you can do four two-hour shows a day, that's where you're going to build your word power. Mm. And there was nothing I wouldn't say on one of those stages to keep a crowd or to keep going. But all of these experiences have just been the joy of my life. And um, as I say, chapter one is closed. We'll see what chapter two is. Um, but well, I'll speak for the industry, and those trade shows are going to miss you too. I, yeah, I know that I'll miss. Yeah, they are. Miss you inside the trade show. Uh, before we wrap up, Christine, do you have a do you have a a, a parting shot, or do you uh, you have anything else you want to add? I just want to add that it has been such a honor and a privilege to like just chat with both of you guys here and to just have, and to hear Robert, like confirm, like commit, make a decision, commit to it. And I'm just sitting here thinking of the beauty pro podcast and the coaching and the salon ownership and all of these things. And it's like, figure out what, again, this is the coaching part, right? Figure out who you are, what you want and why, and then just throw yourself at it. And so hearing Robert, like I'm I'm like, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Right. And I'm just taking it in and I'm like, wow, this is great. So uh, I am very privileged. Thank you for letting me co-host with you today, Corey. And, and thank you, Robert and Mary for coming on. Mary's been filming the whole episode. Yes, girl. Okay, yes. Go, go Mary. That's awesome. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up for Christine. 
thank yeah. you for hanging out with me today. Robert Cromings, as always, you know, thank you for, for giving us your time and, and, and you know, where, where I thought this was going to be like a, a retirement legacy thing. It's just like, no, no, sir. Like, like I'm only, I'm only beginning. This is, we're getting ready for act two here. I can't wait to see what act two is. Mary, you know, I love you. Thank you very much for arranging this. Um, I can't wait to see you guys on the road. I hope that, uh, Mary, even if you're traveling, I hope that uh, I hope that Robert is is riding your coattails into the shows just because uh, just selfishly so I can see you guys at, at, at all the big shows. But uh, but once again, thank you guys very much. Thanks for hanging out with us. And thank you for joining us on your day off. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review to listen to all the latest podcasts. Please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet and to stay connected on and off the show. You can follow us at hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Peace and love.